Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming in this morning. I guess some folks are taking the three-day weekend, but we're, we're glad for those of you who are here. We have a really good guest today. His name is Kevin Ring. He's the president of FAM, which uh, focuses on um, prison reform, sentencing reform, criminal justice, uh, which is a big issue these days, as you all may be aware. Um, and he, uh, he came to this position by a very non-direct route, which I hope he's going to talk about a little. So, Kevin? Right. Is this on? Um, it will be in a minute. Oh, okay. It's not that many of you I can talk anyway. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll just start. Um, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for John, a friend of mine. Uh, I usually say neighbor, and then I would say, we're friends. <laughs> we're not just neighbors, but I, I classify people that way. Um, yeah, so I came to FAM. I'm, I'm hoping to talk about some of the work we do, but uh, the route I did get to FAM was very indirect. I was, anybody know the show um, Family Ties? Al Alex P. Keaton, yeah. the character. Yeah, I, I made myself into that when I was younger. I grew up in a small town in Connecticut, and I just didn't care about politics, law, anything. I just cared about sports and everything. But then I got to college, and I got bit by the political bug, and I used to come down here during the summers and intern. My brother was a lawyer down here. Um, and I just became sort of this hard-charging, very political person. And because of that, um, I went to law school at night, and I worked on Capitol Hill during the day. Um, and I rose up through the ranks on Capitol Hill. I ended up on the Senate Judiciary Committee, then um, working for the Constitution Subcommittee, which was run by a guy by the name of John Ashcroft before he became Attorney General. He was the chairman of the committee. And I got close to him, and I think I'm doing this great work. And um, then it was time to like have a life. I graduated from law school, and I wanted to get married. And I did what everybody does when they leave the Hill, which is I became a lobbyist, which I really didn't want to be. At, when I was working on the Hill, I thought lobbying was just terrible and bad. And, um, but then I was being recruited to do it. I didn't know what else to do, so I became a lobbyist. And I turned out to, I loved it. Um, it was a very interesting job because I viewed it very much as the practice of law. You have a client come in, they have an issue they need, and you try to figure out how to help them succeed. Um, and you use your relationships on the Hill, you use what you know about substantive areas of the law. So I enjoyed that job. Um, my boss at the time was a guy by the name of Jack Abramoff. I don't know if anyone knows that name. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Trust me, I speak to colleges, everyone's like, I don't know that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Google it. Uh, um, so yeah, Jack, I didn't know him when I went there, but I knew the people that worked on his team. And at the time, it was like this honor, because I was a Republican staffer, and he was considered the top Republican lobbyist in town. And so to go there was like being chosen. And so that was, you know, great. And so uh, I was a lobbyist. I was doing work I loved, started a family. I, I was so big for my britches that I lived a block from here. <laughs> I lived on Rosemary Street. And I thought, oh, I had hit it big. Um, but our firm, it, I mean, the long story is Abramoff was in trouble for defrauding clients sort of outside the firm. And then soon there became an investigation of the firm's lobbying practices. And so I was you know, a senior member of that team. And um, soon they were looking at how we were getting our legislative accomplishments. Abramoff was, in it, while he was stealing from the clients outside, he was explaining away that this wasn't fraud because he was delivering for them through his lobbying practice. And so then they came and said, well, what are you guys actually getting for these clients and how? So then the emphasis became on, well, wait a minute, you're taking staffers and members of Congress out to lunches and dinners. You're taking them to ball games and you're doing these things. That's corruption. And for a lot of us who grew up on the Hill and at the time were lobbyists and every suite in every stadium was full of lobbyists with other staffers, we're like, no, we're doing what lobbyists do. And they said, yeah, but this is different, not only in terms of this, you know, sort of scope of it, because Abramoff had two suites and, you know, a restaurant and was sort of flaunting it, but because of his other stuff, they subpoenaed all of our firm's emails. And so now you were seeing how the sausage was made. You were seeing conversations like, well, this guy's been really helpful for us. We should really be helping him. And so to the Justice Department, that became, this is quid pro quo. This is bribery. This is fraud, whatever. And so um, I was saying before, in 2004, just as we were closing on that house, the first article appeared in the Washington Post that the FBI was investigating our law firm. And so it was, you know, 
scary as you, uh, you could imagine. And the investigation started. The firm was looking at all of us. I had to leave our firm. We found out the FBI was investigating the scandal. I had to get an attorney. I, um, I said, let's reach out to the Justice Department. I only have one story. If I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble. But let's just go in and cooperate and say everything we know. Um, we reached out to the government in, I mean, in, I mean, it was October 2004. And they never called us back. But then all of a sudden, people started being indicted and pleading guilty, cooperating against others. And the news started tightening. So at this time, I'm, we got out of here. <laughs> we just thought bad things are happening. So we moved out. We, we moved out to Kensington. Um, and it just was you know, five years of horror of the government circling. I then started cooperating. I started going in every other, like once a month, I would go in and spend a full day. I would tell the firm I had meetings on the Hill, and I would just be sitting with a table of government investigators from different um, departments going through emails I had written. It was, it was really so many things got thrown back in my face over the course of this scandal. But one of them was when I was working at Greenberg Traug, the firm we're at, somebody said, don't put anything in an email you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the Washington Post. And I would always be like, oh, you guys are such babies. Don't be so nervous all the time. <laughs> and damn, if my emails weren't on the front page of the Post. <laughs> um, really just embarrassing stuff. And then the Senate committee was investigating. The Indian Affairs Committee was investigating. So they got all of our emails. They were leaking them out. So everything was being public. And I had a wife and two young kids. And you know, we just lived. We were just very nervous. And as I was cooperating, you know, the government was saying, oh, you're being very truthful, very candid. I had to admit, admit a lot of embarrassing things. But we got to a point where they said, um, you know, basically, you have to admit that you gave these things of value to these members of Congress that you worked for, including uh, the first person I worked for on Capitol Hill, who was like a second father to me, and that you did that in exchange for them doing official acts for you, that this was a bribery relationship, a quid, quid pro quo. And I couldn't say that. I didn't believe that to be true. I definitely, I mean, at the time, giving gifts and things was lawful. We shouldn't have done it. They banned it afterwards. I would have been a better lobbyist if you couldn't do that. But I did do that. But I didn't, all that mattered at the point was intent. We weren't fighting over the facts of whether I had done these things and whether members of Congress had done acts that favored my clients. It was, was it transactional? And I was going to have to testify that this one congressman, I gave him things of value, and in return, he did things for me. And if I had stopped giving him things of value, he would have stopped doing things that were helpful to my clients. I didn't believe that to be true. People can have a different view of that. Just assume for the sake of this <laughs> discussion that I believed what I said. So at that point, the government offered me a plea deal and said, if you plead guilty and say these things and testify against these members of Congress, including this one, you know, things will be fine for you, no jail or whatever. But if you don't, we're going to make life miserable for you. So at that point, once I didn't agree to testify against others, the others that I was supposed to testify again were starting to plead guilty. And the noose was tightening. And that was happening sort of professionally and personally, because at this point, I had moved my mother down. And she had been fighting cancer for a number of years. And I was very close to my father-in-law. And since I had to leave my last law firm, I was home raising my youngest daughter, who was now three. And just the walls came in. Once I didn't accept the plea deal, my father-in-law died. And then a few months later, my mother died. And then a few weeks later, the FBI raided our house at 7 o'clock one morning, 15 agents circling the house. It was, it was news in Kensington. <laughs> because we weren't used to that sort of occurrence, and it was very embarrassing, uh, but also very traumatic. Um, it, it, I, I, all I can say is um, you don't know how invasive it is until you sort of see it through the wife, I mean, your wife's eyes. Because I was nervous, of course, that they came banging on the door and surround the house. And my older daughter, I think it was like eight, was hiding in her pajamas under the kitchen table, scared. And my youngest daughter was sleeping in between us, and we went down. and. You know, they start streaming into the house. And, you know, it, it, you know, and they're going through all everybody's, you know, closets and drawers and stuff. And uh, it, it, it was, it's sort of hard to, it's hard to explain how invasive that was and how sort of 
impactful that was and seeing my kids and they were they were looking at me to see how I was judging this and my wife was crying and I remember being upset that she was crying and in hindsight being so embarrassed that I thought of course this was hard for her um, but you know the kids you know it was my my daughter Kylie still had to go to school that day and so we walked to the bus stop and, sh and I said she said well, well you know I didn't know the FBI was coming over today I said yeah I didn't either <laughs> and I said but you know we told them if you need help, if they're investigating bad guys, we'll help. I just didn't know they were coming today, but that's it. And so then later that, then they were there all day. And then when she got off the bus later that afternoon, I came and she goes, I told everybody at school I couldn't have a play date today because the FBI's are at our house. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, all right. And I just thought, I couldn't imagine what those other parents were like, that girl's got a pretty big imagination. But she was right. Um, so that was really traumatic. My lawyer said, please don't come back. Um, don't do this because I had been cooperating. Um, I had turned over lots of information. If they could have asked for anything, I would have given it to them. And then a few weeks later, I mean, they raided the house. Four days later, my wife said, I can't do this anymore. We need a divorce. And I said, oh, I understand <laughs> that feeling. Uh, so I moved into the basement. And then I was in the basement when a month later they came back, again, 7 in the morning, to arrest me um, instead of letting me turn myself in. So bangs on the door, agents there. Um, you know, you're under arrest, we have a warrant for your arrest, and we're going to take you out. And I said, well, I was in t-shirt. So I said, can I get dressed? Yes, but we got to follow you back in. I could hear my kids stirring. I didn't want them to see me, so I said, let's just go. So we went, go down to D.C. jail, handcuffs, leg irons all day, um, and then I had to get arraigned um, that day and plead, and then I got to leave. This, it took a long time for things to, like, progress. And so shortly, I mean, I ended up in a legal fight for a long time, but after that happened, shortly after that, 11 months after my mother died, then my father died. And then my wife said, you have to get out of the house. And I said, I'm never leaving my kids. My whole worry was that I was going to be away from my kids if things went wrong. And so she moved out. And so I, people say they hit rock bottom, and that was rock bottom. I was alone in my house, my two young daughters, my parents had both died. I was under indictment and I was facing trial. Um, and at the time I remember just thinking, I hope there's a judge who's gonna see this differently. That was my only hope, was that when I had been on Capitol Hill and I, I didn't think about these criminal justice issues, I thought, okay, good punishments, whatever makes the job easier for prosecutors. And now here I was, once the prosecutors decided I was a bad guy, there was no way out of this. The only thing I had left was I was gonna go before a judge, hopefully, and she was going to be a neutral arbiter and say, here's what the government's allegations are, here's his defense, and at some point I'm going to see these things differently. That was my only hope. But since I didn't plead guilty, the government ended up asking for 17 and a half to 22 and a half years in prison for me. They had offered me a deal for no prison time, and then Abramoff had gotten four and a half after he pled, and then they asked for 20 years for me. And I just remember thinking, this confirms everything that is wrong. And at this time, I start working for FAM because that's like the only place in town that would take me and I could work from home and do grant writing for them. And I was learning about cases of people that looked a lot different than me. Um, they, didn't, they didn't look like me, they didn't have my background, they didn't have my education, certainly not my skin color. And they were enduring much worse than I was. Um, one of the first people I wrote about was a woman named Stephanie Nod, who sold crack in Mobile, Alabama for one month. And then she got away from it, but the kingpin, her, who was a boyfriend, you know, pled guilty, in implicated her, and the government threatened her. She said, I, didn't, I did it for one month, I'm not some kingpin. So she went to trial, got convicted, and got 30 years in prison. And so I started reaching out, I was talking to her while she was in prison, and I started writing about her story, because we were trying to change that law. Um, and, and just so many things happened where I became friends with her because we were writing back and forth. And I remember hearing about her kids and thinking, you know, this was part of the story we're trying to say. It's like, surely this crime, punishment doesn't fit the crime. And by the way, the U.S. attorney who prosecuted her was Jeff Sessions. It was before he became a, a senator. Um, but Steph and I became friends, and I remember um, the hardest thing I thought was like leaving my girls. That was the only thing I didn't want to do. So. I didn't fight the government because I was bullheaded. It was because I didn't think I was guilty. And when things got so bad, I just thought, 
when I was a lobbyist or as a political person, I just felt like I was always cutting, not cutting corners, but like shading truth. I was always spinning. And I think when you do that, if, you, if your life is used to spinning things or putting things in a political way, you lose touch with the truth a little bit. And I remember when we, when the government, we were at this impasse about pleading guilty and I thought, and so many friends of mine, even like tough on crime people, and certainly my wife, were like, just say what, the, you, say what they want you to say. Just make this go away. And I just thought, I can't, I'm not doing that. Like, I feel like I've lied too much. And this is the, like, I just felt this incredible clarity that I'm just gonna tell the truth and just let whatever happens, happen. Um, and so, I mean, so that's, I mean, so that's why it happened is because all I had to do was just say, yeah, you know, I did these things and, and that happened. Um, but I was just, I just didn't want to leave my girls, and I was now I'm in touch with Stephanie, who's in prison. She's been ser she served 20 years at that point, and I said, oh, you know, so we're t talking. And then finally, I told her about my situation because she had been talking about her kids and stuff. And I just said, hey, listen, you wouldn't know this, but I may end up if things go bad, I'm going to be leaving here, and this is what's going on. And at one point, we we're having this exchange over this period of time, and she said, hey, um, let me know what sizes your girls are. And I said, why? She said, well, if I get out of here before you do, I'll make sure they have dresses for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, this is incredible grace. Um, and some of the people we met when I was working on this, uh, who I was working with for FAM, these people had been serving incredibly long sentences. And again, they were very different than I was, but they had kids and they had families and they had people who loved them. And those differences started to seem smaller. They just came from different backgrounds. And they definitely made mistakes just as I had. And then the question was just, were these punishments proportionate to the crime? That's what we were really mo mostly focused on. Um, so we hit an impasse. Everything kept going and going. And finally, in 2009, I went to trial. And the first jury hung on all counts, which is usually a good thing. And usually the government says, OK, we're done. And they said, no, we're going to try you. A, we're going to try you again immediately. But then they had to wait until another case went to the Supreme Court to decide what the law they were prosecuting me under meant. It's honest services fraud uh, was the statute. It's why Bob McDonald is free, is because the Supreme Court ruled in his case. Um, so a year later, they tried me again. I was convicted of half the counts. And that's when um, I went to sentencing, and the government said, we're asking at first for life. And then they said, the guidelines call for a life sentence. And then they said, oh, no, we're using the wrong version of the guidelines, 17 and a half to 22 and a half years. And my judge said, this is crazy. She had sat through two trials, and as I had hoped, she said, he is not what you said he was. He was a player in this larger thing. And um, so she sentenced me to 20 months in prison and then let me stay out while I appealed to the circuit court. And I went up to the Supreme Court, who decided not to hear the case. And so January 7th, 2014, I reported to federal prison camp in Cumberland, Maryland, where I spent a year and a half and then came back. And I had been working at that point for FAM for five years, and so then I was in prison, I like to say on assignment for FAM, like <laughs> trying to help people get out, file compassion release motions, do other things, look at, um, see if I could help them in any way. It was interesting, my daughters would come visit me like once a month. And they would sit in the visiting room and they got to see the other families meeting. And so it was helpful that for them, you know, it, at first it was the hardest visit because you know, you're used to just hugging your kids, and now they're coming into a sterile environment, and they don't know if they should touch you, and you're in a, you know, a green outfit and boots, and so it was very hard for them. And they actually, on their first visit, they got turned away at the door because they had like leggings, and you couldn't wear that into the prison, so they had to mom had to take them to a thrift store to buy some jeans, and they came in. So it was just a you know, it was just a terrible environment for them to be in, but to just sit there in a plastic chair away from them and not be able to, you know. Over time though, they, you know, they'd sit there and come, who's that, what's he in for? <laughs> you know, we'd go through everybody in the visiting room. So that when they came back, they knew these people. And my daughter, you know, this huge mountain of a black man named Bolarina Ariai, played basketball with him. I mean, just became my best friends with my youngest daughter and she would write to him later. But they got to see something they wouldn't have seen. They saw families of people who were there for what you would consider serious crimes. Um, oh, I should mention, there's no white collar prisons anymore. That ended with the drug war. People always say, oh, was it like a club fed? There are none of that. Um, n you know, 
three quarters of the guys I served with were black or brown, and they were serving drug offenses or gun offenses. Um, it weren't violent to be in a camp. You have to be under 10 years and no violence. But there's no, you know, swimming pool or whatever. I don't know what people think there are in prison, but it's not that. But it was, it, but it was safe. Um, but so my daughters, you know, got to see what that was like and learn from that experience in the same way I did. I should also say I got some comeuppance. When I was on the Hill, I wrote a criminal law for Senator Ashcroft. At the time, in the late 90s, methamphetamine was becoming the big drug. It was sweeping the Midwest, and Missouri was getting hit, California was getting hit. And so I was his counsel on the committee, and we said, let's toughen the penalties for methamphetamine. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just, I mean, that was just a knee-jerk reaction. Like, this is bad. Make penalties worse. Um, and so we said, well, let's equal them to the crack penalties, because those were considered the worst. And so Feinstein and Ashcroft did that. I wrote that bill. It passed. And now I'm at Cumberland serving time with people who are serving longer sentences because of the bill I wrote. Um, so that was, huh? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was humbling and helpful in some ways. Um, and so I just, you know, lots of prison stories. Um, but I just got through it and, you know, came home in April of 2015. With an, I was on ankle bracelet for two months and um, stayed working for FAM. And then in January of 2017, took over. My boss, who had founded it in 1991 when her brother went to prison, wanted to leave. And so I took over as president. And I find that my background, having done lobbying and policy, is really helpful to what we're doing. Um, I don't think people shouldn't be punished. I don't think people shouldn't be held accountable. I do think prison is needed for some people. Um, but I just think we rely on it too much. I remember the day my brother and my nephew picked me up to bring me to prison. And I just remember thinking, of course, I was feeling sorry for myself. And my daughters that morning went to school before I left. I remember the night before. And they said, we can't watch you leave. And I thought that was incredibly strong of them. Um, so they went to school that morning. and. I just remember leaving thinking like, can there, is there no other way for us to get our pound of flesh from people? Even if you believed I did what they said, even if it was the worst, is there nothing else? There's no other way. Is prison needed for everybody that we put? And then the people I met in prison, again, it was the lowest level. I mean, I thought about a third of those people didn't need to be there at all. I thought a third of the people did and probably if they didn't straighten out, we're going to have trouble staying out. And then there was like a third who with rehabilitation and some programming and some different way of treating people while they're in prison, we're going to be successful when they got out. Um, but they were going to be a little, you know, it was, that was going to be a tougher category. And so when I came home, FAM had only worked on sentencing. And we moved into doing prison reform for precisely that reason. Congress was considering prison reform. And I just realized there was no programming. There was nothing. We were just sitting idle for the most part. We played basketball and did some things. If you needed your GED, you could get that. But otherwise, the ACE classes was adult continuing education. Like, I learned how to crochet. <laughs> um, and people learned how to play bridge or do current events. And that's fine. I mean, it's good to keep people busy because it's boring. Um, but this was not rehabilitative in most, it, you know, for the most part. And so the guys who wanted to get college courses, they did it by correspondence. You know, in 1992, we took away Pell Grants from people who were incarcerated. They used to be able to get Pell Grants. And in the crime bill in 94, I'm sorry, we eliminated that. Um, and so these guys, not only don't they have money, but they're, they don't have computer access. So they're doing this by correspondence with colleges that are mostly unaccredited. And so, you know, kudos to them for trying to pursue their education, but the prison isn't helping them. Um, and so we said, well, let's get involved in this more. And so, you know, the things we were pushing were things like rehabilitative programming. Also, the, there's a 500-mile rule in the federal prison system where we send people so far away from their kids that they don't even get a chance to visit them. I was lucky. I mean, I was two and a half hours away. But that's still a five-hour round trip. For, you know. So I was lucky, and it was still an ordeal. My kids you know, didn't want to come all the time. But I was serving time with guys from Rhode Island. And it was technically 500 miles, because they measure air miles, not driving miles. So, um, so in the first step back that just passed, we changed that to driving miles, and also said if space opens up closer, move them closer. They're not doing that yet. But, so there's so many things we can do. And I guess I'll close on this, and then we'll just do whatever you want to do. Um, I talk about this because I don't look like the normal federal felon. And because 
I had to learn through the experience I had. And I, I speak at colleges and they'll say, well, why didn't you know this stuff before it happened to you? And I just didn't because I didn't, because I grew up in different places and had different life experiences. I wish I knew everything always, and, but I didn't. And so when I grew up in my small town, I played Little League baseball and football, and I had a paper route, and I worked as a cashier. And I didn't have friends who were selling drugs, or friends' parents who were selling drugs, and then doing it in the house, and, or selling unmarked guns, or things that I just couldn't have known other people were doing. And I felt very much that when I was younger, when I was Alex P. Keaton, I would have made a moral judgment about those people that not everybody does it though, so you could choose not to do that. And that there's truth to that. There are people who are incredibly you know, strong in an adverse situation, but I wasn't. I just did what my friends did. You know, We drank beer at 14. That's not right either, but we did it because we all did it. And, and so I just realized that my experiences were different and it got very hard to look at these people who were making those choices as if if I were in their situation, I would have done differently. It's not to excuse that behavior. I mean, drug dealing is inherently dangerous. There's a lot of violence with that. Um, but I, it's hard to be so judgmental about it in a way that you think, are we punishing it accordingly? Like, is that such a moral failing? Are they so culpable that they have to go to prison for 20 or 30 years, which is what we were doing at the height of the drug war? Similarly, I said to the people who were in, in there for drug crimes, and they look at me, when I got there, they're like, you idiot, you had it made. And I get that. But I also know that I was doing what everybody else was doing, too. So as a lobbyist, you know, if somebody, if, if you had pulled me aside and said, and shook me, and, and, and we went away to an island for a year, and you said, why in the world is it okay to give anything to a public official? Why can you give them a hamburger, or a ticket to a concert? Like, how can that possibly be in the public interest that you do that? How does that make th inform their decision making? I mean, I might have got that. But when you're on the treadmill of life and this is the rules and there's a gift rule that says you can give up the $50 and you can do all these things and you go to the baseball games and every suite in the stadium is full with other lobbying firms hosting members of Congress and staff. You just don't think like that. And so when I had my sort of moment of, you know, moving into the basement all alone, you know, and my wife had left and everything was rock bottom, I just thought, I'm just going to, from this point on, my mistakes are going to be my own. I'm just going to try to be as present as I can, each decision that comes up. I always think of this, uh, you know, in our house, the serenity prayer was a big thing. And so my sister had needle pointed it, my dad had it on his denim. And I just remember thinking, you know, things I can't control, because so much was happening at once, I just thought, I'm just, I'm not even going to worry about it. But the things I can control, I am going to 100% try to make good decisions on. That's why I didn't plead guilty, because I know it would have been easier, but I didn't feel, I would have, it was like, I, it, to get really dramatic, um, my mother and I were really big fans of Les Miserables. And so I remember just thinking like, the whole, if I speak, I am condemned. If I stay silent, I'm damned. And I felt like it was just the opposite. Like, I could have testified against these guys and made my life a lot easier. But then I would have thought, what is worse than bearing false witness under oath in a court of law against a friend who you didn't think did something? And I just thought, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not wargaming this out to what's going to make my life better. I just thought, in each spot, I'm just going to make decisions that are the right thing in the moment and I'm not going to play it out, which is exactly the opposite of how I had lived my life. And so that's it. I needed that experience. And um, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, my life is far from perfect now, but they say, you know, when in a crisis, you realize the things that matter to you. And I was living in Chevy Chase, and I had definitely a good life from the outside. But when this all happened, I was so fortunate to get a clarity that I would not have had but for having had this experience. And I know a lot of people have had, you know, I always say like near-death experiences, and, and that is true of people. For some people, it's physically true. But for me, it was just this experience which took me off the rails of life, which I needed to figure out what do I want to do? What do I think is right? And not like what is everybody else doing? And so I always say to people, I wouldn't wish this experience on anybody, but I wouldn't trade it now either. Because my life has changed in a lot of ways. I'm definitely, you know, I'm poorer, but I'm, you know, but I'm happier. Um, 
I spent an incredibly great amount of time with my kids to the point where when I left, I had no doubt we had a relationship that the day I came back, their mom moved out and they're back with me and we're together, you know, we have them and now my oldest is getting, we're looking at colleges. So, and she got a great college essay out of it. <laughs> 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 because if you're a little white girl from suburban Maryland, they ain't got a lot of adversity to talk about. <laughs> but dad went to prison is not a bad story. Um, I'll stop there. I, I, I would like to hear what questions I'd like to talk about the work we're doing now. And, um, and thank you for listening. So we'll just take a few minutes here to talk and then I hope we get to hear from everybody. Th thanks so much, that was a really moving story. Um, we have some, the personal side, the treadmill of life side yeah. and, and the policy side. I'm gonna give you a few minutes to talk about the policy side um, as in what, what is FAM doing now and in a larger picture, why is criminal justice reform the subject of so much attention now? Um, I, I mean, yeah, prisons yeah. have often needed reform in the history of the country, but w what's going on now? Yeah, so I would say I think part of the reason it's becoming more of a popular issue is because it's hitting so many people. I used, when I go to, this, when I've been speaking at colleges or anywhere, I will say, how many people know somebody in their immediate family or close family friend who's been to prison? And like half the audience always raises their hand. And that just wouldn't have been true when I was younger. Well, there's two things about that. One, it wouldn't have been true, and two, people wouldn't have raised their hand. It was like growing up in my small town in Connecticut. I'm like, I didn't know any gay people. And now it's like, are you kidding? Because people didn't identify. And I think with prison, when the, when the FBI raided our house, the next morning um, after the kids had left the bus stop and stuff, like over the next week, starting the next morning, people would come up to me and say, I've never told anybody this, but my brother was in prison for seven years who did drugs. Hey, I've never told anybody this, but my father, like, I was just like, why is nobody talking about this? Like, I definitely felt alone, I mean, it was fine. It was the least of my problems feeling alone about that, but it had hit a lot of people. Last year's study came out by a group called Forward US that said one in two adult Americans has had an immediate family member who has at least spent some time in jail or prison. And so, it's just true, Abraham Lincoln said, if you wanna, if you wanna repeal a law, enforce it strictly. <laughs> and we are sending so many people to prison, you know, 2.2 million, if you know the big numbers, 2.2 million, more than any other country. Per capita, we're, no one's close to us. Russia, China, anybody. We're so far ahead of any country. Of course, the racial disparity is even greater, but even among white Americans, it's higher than Europe. So I do think it's one thing, it's just it's impacted more people. And, and my boss who started the group, I mean, her brother went to jail for marijuana in Washington State. He was a college kid. So it was just, it, it was hitting communities that it wasn't, had been hitting before. When this was a, considered an urban problem among poor, it, it, was, it was less talked about. But now it's hitting people like me, and so now it's urgent, right? Um, so I think that's why more people are talking about it. I think evolution matters. I just think we get smarter, the circle of compassion grows, and people change how they look at people. Um, obviously that's been the true of civil rights and civil liberties in this country. And I think with people who are incarcerated, again, not to compare them, these aren't immutable characteristics, but you see yourself in other people. And so you see people make mistakes, and you say, well, that could be me. So maybe a little grace is extended in that way, and so we're, we're understanding people more. Um, so I think that's why, uh, as, as it's, it became the fastest growing part of a lot of state budgets, so you had fiscal conservatives saying, this is, is there a cheaper way to do this? Um, and then you had social conservatives, religious conservatives saying, I believe in redemption, I believe in second chances, this doesn't feel consistent with that. And then you had social justice folks saying, I'm looking at racial justice angles about this, and this doesn't make sense either. You even had constitutionalists like me who was thinking, how is this separation of powers? How do the prosecutors have the power through mandatory minimums to not only decide who to prosecute, but to pick their sentence? Because if they come with a mandatory minimum, the judge has no discretion. The reason I could go to trial is because my judge was gonna have discretion. My crime didn't carry a mandatory minimum, so she was gonna have some discretion. 
if there had been a mandatory sentence of 20 years, I think maybe my calculus would have been a lot harder because I would have known if I got convicted, that would have been the sentence. At FAM, we can't work on all these issues. There's a lot of hot issues. We used to work just on sentencing and mostly focused on mandatory sentences. But now we're also, like I said, because of my experience and just because our families, who we deal a lot with, who inform our advocacy, have talked about their prison experiences. We just waged a campaign to close a prison in, Parch in uh, Parchman, Mississippi, which is disgusting. I mean, there's people killing each other. They're in there for serious crimes, but you know, they're getting no food. Their prisons in the summer are 110 you know, degrees. They're treated like animals. We would not treat animals like this. We have rules about animal shelters in this country that require better treatment than we do in a lot of our prisons and jails. And they're living hell holes. And 95% of them are gonna come home someday. And so the question isn't like, should we be nice? It's like, even if you act in your self-interest, don't we want them to come back better than they went in? Because they're gonna come back to our community, and yet we treat them in a way that discards them. So we're focused now on prison reform as well. So basically, from the point you're charged to the point you come home, there's a lot of good work being done in reentry, things like ban the box, um, where we want people to get jobs and things like that. But we focus more on from the time you go to the time you come home. Big picture, beyond fam. What, what three changes would you want American society to make? Well, it's hard to get out of my fam hat enough to say that. <laughs> I, I, mean, I do think we have to eliminate mandatory sentencing because we do have a system that calls for checks and balances. And I, you know, I, don't, I, don't begrudge, I don't think prosecutors as a group are any better or worse than any other group. I just think when you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And if you're a prosecutor and you've decided somebody's a bad guy, you want as much leverage as you can to make them plead guilty. Keep in mind that 90, over 97% now of cases in America are decided by plea. I was one, I mean, I was in a group of two and a half percent of people a year who go to trial. We and, the, and they tried to leverage you into yes. being, going into and the majority. The, and so the longer the sentences they have, they can bludgeon you into doing that. Now again, some people deserve that, but in order to have a fair system, it's like if you write something, you want two or three people looking at it to edit it. I think when it comes to punishment, it's better when a prosecutor recommends a sentence then a judge has a chance to weigh in on that, and if the judge is too lenient or too harsh, you can appeal that. But with mandatory sentencing, you don't get that. So I think that throws the whole system out of whack. I should mention this, too, because everyone always says, why don't people go to trial? And they say, oh, it's prohibitively expensive. But they never say what that means. I will tell you, because I ended up not paying all of it, my cooperation with the government and trials cost $2 million. So I drained my life savings, my brother took out a second mortgage on his house, and we paid a million of it. And then I, my attorneys became court appointed, so they became like public defenders so that they could stay with the case so we didn't have to bring in new lawyers. And then they got paid the public defender rate. But when people say it's prohibitively expensive to go to trial, it's not like they're just saying that, like, oh, I don't want to spend a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand, two million, um, in my case. Um, other changes that should be made. Um, I do think we have to reimagine prisons. Uh, if you go, if you look at, I'm um, 60 Minutes has done some specials on this. If you look at prisons in Europe and other countries, and even my own experience, yeah, you want to. People are broken when they go, and then you want to build them up, and we don't do that. You know, you're inmate this, you're treated like garbage, and you are made to feel less than and people get institutionalized and infantilized when they're in prison. I saw guys who were just, you know, they knew what it took to get by. I mean, they did their laundry, they knew child, you know, when the meals were, they did that. But you, you didn't have to pay bills, you didn't have to worry about your kids, you didn't have any of the pressures you're gonna have when you go back to life. So you're taking an antisocial population and you're putting them in the most antisocial environment. And that retards growth and infantilizes people in a way that makes them less equipped when they come out. And so some way of changing how we think about prisons so that people have more responsibility, they're treated with more dignity and respect so that these are not new to them when they come out. I, I get the idea of breaking them and then, but we don't restore them before they leave. And a third one, uh, I don't know if I have a third one at the ready. There's okay. so many things that need to be fixed. So. Well, that, that leads us to one more question here you and I were discussing before, and d for human beings, does it take a major disaster to get you off of the treadmill of life, to, to, to educate you, redirect you, whatever it is? Yeah, I hope not. 
I, I mean, I hope there's people stronger than I was that are smarter than I was. Um, I think there's things that I know that I learned that I didn't have to experience, but this was one. Um, I didn't think about prisoners. I didn't think about who was in jail. I didn't think about sentences and things like that because it was not my life. And so how could I have been smarter about that? You know, I could have been just a more compassionate person and just got it. I like to think there are things that I, that I was ahead of the curve on. Um, and I can, I, I, there were, but this is an area where I'm afraid I needed to get my butt kicked. And I see it a lot with others. And I don't feel apologetic that it took a life experience to change my view. I would feel bad if I had that life experience and it didn't mm -hmm. change my view and I didn't yeah. do anything with the new information I had. Yeah. Um, I try to speak, again, because I am not the person you think of who's in federal prison, and so I'm trying to reach audiences that might not otherwise um, see it or might have seen it the way I did before. But you know what? I am, you know, I read a lot, but I do think there's something about life experience that you need to have um, to understand some issues, and this is one for me. And I, but but some people get it. They, some people, you know, their orientation is just different. But I was, you know, like I said, I was more of a law and order person and black and white thinker. And this just didn't get there for me. Okay. Questions, folks? We got whoa. <laughs> Not a big audience, but it's participatory. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been reading a lot about, uh, it, art, there are a lot of articles being published about conditions in prisons and injustice. And, and it's slowly dawned on me that there are so many different types of prisons. There are county jails, detention centers for juveniles, state prisons, federal prisons of different levels too. If you do the reform at the federal level, um, will that, drive change in those lower levels? Because some of the worst things, like the case of Sandra Bland, are happening in county yeah, jails yeah. And, and prisons in some of the more benighted states. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it's just um, inexcusable and scandalous. Yeah, totally right about that. Federal won't govern that. There's not gonna be a, a standard. So one of the big things we're doing is not just trying to call out this. I mean, part of this is culture changing, right? So it's, you want people talking about a, a bottom level of, of um, what those conditions of confinement should be like. But there are prisons like in Ohio and stuff where, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's unbelievable. And in Michigan, where it's a state prison, we're working on parchment. Our goal is not just to fix it. I don't want just Germany's prisons. When we're trying to pass these reforms, what we're trying to include in all of them is what just got passed in New Jersey and Washington State was the first to do, which is independent oversight. So you want to get a correction, corrections ombudsman who then is in place. And you have you know, sort of like an inspector general type that makes mm -hmm. sure the conditions stay that. Because you know, people say sunlight is the best disinfectant, and the prisons are the darkest places. We don't allow press to go there. We don't allow the public to go in there. So of course, with no oversight, this is what they become. And so we're trying to create independent oversight bodies so that you know, you could have the greatest standards in the world, but if there's no mechanism for tracking them. So that's really the thing. But it has to happen at the county level, state level, and federal level. You just hope that having the discussion at all leads the people to believe that that to buy in at least to the concept. I, I mean, I know people, when I go to speak to people, they're like, did you get raped in prison? You know, they'll ask me that. And I just think, it's amazing, and that's still a joke on sitcoms, that, you know, don't drop the soap, that we think that that's okay, that somebody would go to prison and be sexually assaulted, that that's like the price of the crime you've committed. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's like, this is culture changing, and so it's gonna take a while, but that's the goal of doing it anywhere. I have, a, I have a basic question. What does FAM stand for? Oh, that's a good one. So it was founded to mean Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And Families Against Mandatory Minimums. So against these mandatory minimum sentences. But a couple years ago when we were doing a sort of whatever, you know, trying to rebrand a little bit, 
we just don't work just on that because we do prison reform and other things. We're just sort of casting ourselves too narrowly. So we just, but we like the idea of FAM because people have the idea of, it's a known name in the prisons. We email 47,000 federal prisoners every week. And people know the name. And FAM is FAM, family. You know, so we've sort of just became FAM, Families for Justice Reform. But that, its origin was mandatory sentencing. More? A, f a former prosecutor? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say uh, no, but like I, it's it's outside our scope. So like, I don't know that you know the first one. No, I don't. I, I, we we don't work on that. And the second one, I'm totally willing to believe that in terms of you know sort of the use of force and search and seizure on on even minor things. I don't know what's going on with that. Yeah. It is crazy, and like I mean, it, I'm sure that's happening. And like you said, these are attorneys with friends, so these are these are people with some privilege. It's not right. Yeah. That's part of the problem. I mean, it's been going. I had a yeah. friend who whose job was to be, knock down people's doors in the '90s for years. Um, maybe it spread to. Well, I don't even remember this when they raided through. my house. My wife said that they they were like they threatened to shoot my dog. You know, you always hear about that with these drug raids and stuff. And I was just like. I don't know what it is. You know, it's like it's just it's like you give somebody power and then they use it, right? I, again, I don't want to attribute bad motives to people. I just think it's like when the system allows for that, people will use it. And you know, somebody had written an article. They said, "How much of a badass was this guy? He gave out tickets to the Wiggles, right?" You're just like, "What are you coming in full force like that for?" And so I can imagine that with marijuana, even. And I don't know what that is. And but I will say this: Montgomery County, when I came home and I had to do 200 hours of community service, I went to the used bookstore where I used to like hang out to try to do my community service there. And they're like, you can't do community, you can't, we won't give you hours if it's pursuant to it. And I just thought, wow, this is some woke county. I mean, you know, I, I walk around, I see signs about war's not the answer, and you know, <laughs> Bernie, and you know, no, there's no trouble. And you're not giving me a white, you know, law school educated person a chance to do community service because it's pursuant to a quarter. I thought, what if I were black, I committed a violent offense, so I, it's not, we're not that great on some of this stuff either. What is, what is interesting though, that this thing is in the forefront, so I almost wonder if this is a process we have to go through to find Yes, out. right. Just like you said, well, yeah. Um, two questions. One is, um, are you including for-profit prisons in what you're doing so that they have oversight also? And the other is, is there any thought of, when you're doing the rehabilitation, of doing something like they're doing with the hospital, saying, if you don't have this rate of return, you get this mm -hmm. instead? Oh, yeah, so two, so two things. One, yes, we want private prisons to have the same oversight. I just have to put in my plug that private prisons have become somewhat of a boogeyman. They get outsized attention for their role. I mean, not in immigrant detention, where, they're, where it's big and where they're growing, but in in sort of detention, like at the federal level, for instance, only 8% of federal prisoners are in private detention. I know people in state private facilities that love them so much more than public prisons because at least they're air conditioned, they get more programming. So I understand the ideological opposition to profit motive being in prisons. I just think public prisons suck too. 
And so I think sometimes we focus so much on private prisons in an outsized way. But yes, they need oversight and they don't get it. That has to be part of their contract with the state and that's what's not happening enough. And then in terms of rehabilitation, yeah. So like John Wetzel, who's the uh, Secretary of Corrections, Pennsylvania, with his halfway houses, he's signing performance-based contracts so that they're judged based on recidivism rate of people who leave their halfway houses. And we think the same thing for wardens. Like I would increase warden pay if you thought, I'd give them more flexibility about what tools they could use, give furloughs more, let people get used to the community before they went back. But then I would judge them based on the on recidivism, <laughs> yeah. I, so we're probably, we're not close yet, but I, I mean that idea is being adopted at least in some fashion. Wow, wow. I think we have time for one more and Kevin, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in the, um, in the bulletin, it describes, um, it describes momentum on FAM's side, conservatives and liberals, and you alluded to that in your speech as well. And I, I'm just curious, like, um, how, um, how true is that? Because it, just, it still seems politically um, unappetizing for the conservatives. And like, if I, yes, Trump will be with um, Kim Kardashian doing a high profile, um, uh, commutation, but at the same time at his rallies, he's calling for maximum sentencing and things like that. So I'm just wondering how, how true is it? Do you see both sides getting behind your movie? Yeah, I, I didn't write the bulletin thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, you know what's so funny? It's like when you get in advocacy, you lose yourself. This is the thing I, from my lobbying days, and I was talking about telling the truth. Like, I don't want to be an advocate that's like reads his own press releases and starts to believe them. But when you're trying to get donors, you also want to act as if there's an opportunity. And so is the country better? Are there more Republicans that care about this? Yeah. I mean, we passed the First Step Act in Congress last year because there is more appetite for doing this. But we're so far away. Look at bail reform in New York right now. There's mm -hmm. huge blowback to that uh, among the Republicans there about whether they went too far. Anytime there's a high profile crime, you're still seeing the blowback. So, you know, Yes, it's better than it was. We're, we're figuring out how much reform to pass. We're not adding a lot of mandatory minimums. We just beat back a bill in Pennsylvania where they were trying to add mandatory minimums that five years ago it passed three to one and it lost on the House floor last week. So there's progress, but we're so far away from sort of like where we want to get to that I don't want to oversell that. And there's still a lot of people, you know, more conservatives, definitely Trump. Trump's instincts on this are terrible in my view, even though I, we've worked with the administration. I think his gut is still, you know, he'll fry the Central Park Five, even if they've been exonerated. So I, I think there's a lot of pushback, but it's better. And I know it because, again, even my political background and working with the members of Congress and state lawmakers, it's, it's getting there. Not as fast as we would like and not as fast as some reformers, I think, pretend. So I don't want to be part of that pretending. Can she do hers? Sure. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Becky. I, I was a public defender for 10 years in Seattle, Washington, so the um, state and county courts. But isn't it fundamentally the problem that m these mandatory sentencing guidelines were established actually to cure what was a very racist and subjective and all over the map sentencing problem across the country? So. It seems a little simplistic to think that the criminal justice system would do a lot better just by eliminating these mandatory minimums. Mm -hmm. And even more recently, the sentencing of the individual who raped the woman in San Francisco, and she's now out on tour, he got a six month mm. penalty. He was a white privileged, educated individual. And that's exactly the kind of thing that landed volumes of black people in prison for very, very uh, misdemeanor, low-level crimes. And, and I just want to say one other thing. Um, with the fairness of prosecutors, I mean, the mandatory minimum sentencing is established by the legislator. The prosecutors are functioning in a system that's been sanctioned and established by the, the political engines and machines, they, they can't do a, now, I don't want to detract from the amount of discretion they have in what they charge and the situation you are facing and others face, but I just want to say like the systemic 
efforts to mandatory sentence was to try to cure what was a very racist and violent system that hurt a lot of people. Yeah, I'm gonna, I want to push back on almost all of that. It's a big thing, but I, I wanted to just bring this because yeah. I totally, listen, I function in that system. I get that kind of bind that people are put in every single day. And they have huge discretion in what they charge that will actually pull them within a certain sentencing range. So there's a lot of discretion there. But the structure itself, so the idea of mandatory sentences was to try to level what was otherwise a socioeconomic racial system that allowed tremendous discrimination and harm. Yes, so the guidelines came about because of the 84 Sentencing Reform Act. Everybody was part of that. The federal system. Right, right. Every state had their own, Rockefeller drug laws, everything. Yeah. Everybody who's got their fingerprints on those, the, the Sentencing Reform Act and the guideline systems are totally different than mandatory minimums. Uh -huh. Right, like right. they didn't, they, I mean, they didn't want that. I mean, Ted Kennedy was a co-sponsor of Sentencing Reform Act to establish some guidelines so there was some uniformity in sentencing. Right. And then two years later, Congress put mandatories on top of that. And, in a lot of, and so that's not exactly what they were looking for. In terms of the prosecutors like, oh boy, we've got this tool, we might as well use it, ignores the fact that they aggressively lobby for mandatory minimums in every jurisdiction. That's who we fight against in Pennsylvania and in the federal system. They say if you take away this mandatory minimum, these people are going to walk free, which is totally not true. They are self-interested actors. If teachers come to the legislature and say, the thing that makes student performance better is higher pay and smaller classrooms, lawmakers might say, hey, maybe that's true. You also might say, that's in your interest too, right? Oh, tenure and, long and better pay. I'm going to at least think you're coming with self-interest. When a prosecutor says, give me a tool that lets me not have to go to trial, in 97% of cases, maybe there's some self-interest in that too. And I just want to say about Brock Turner, because that case came up a lot. Uh -huh. That was a guideline sentence that a, that a probation officer said to him. Of course, I think six months for that crime was too short. But we always focus on the one leniency then to yeah. justify mass punitiveness. Well, there's a guy in Mississippi right now who just got 12 years because he got to jail. And he said, where do I charge my cell phone? And they said, you're not supposed to have a cell phone in jail. And so they gave him 12 years for bringing contraband into the prison. We don't make changes on that. We make changes on the one rare case of leniency. And then with Brock Turner, I don't stop. He's on the sex offender registry for life. If I'm Brock Turner, I would have taken a five-year prison sentence and not been on that sex offender registry. We are so punitive that we view with lifetime the sex offender registry where he will not be able to go to his kid's school, will not be able to go to their graduation. If that's lenient, again, I think we're too punitive. And I don't disagree at all that if he were black, he would have been treated differently. I, none of that. It just seems to me that in that case, one act of leniency got a judge recalled. This guy's life is still ruined. And we act as if we better make some changes because of that. We need to end it there. Um, but people are can, welcome to keep talking. Our next service starts in about seven minutes. And Jay, I'd, I'd also just like to give a shout out. Uh, thank you to Annalise Hafer, who suggested this, uh, yes, this forum. Yes, absolutely. And also, also uh, some applause for our guests, because this has really been great. Oh, thank you.